stuff that we... We're actually going to talk about movies and stuff. Okay, yeah. So today we're going to talk about... Uh, this is going to be a much more movie centric episode, so I'm excited yeah. to do it. So we wanted to talk about uh, movies that made us want to make movies, mm -hmm. right? That was the idea. So I kind of have an idea of where I would go with this, but I also, since you, this was kind of your idea to come up with, you start explaining it and talk about some of yours first, and then I'll kind of follow suit. Okay. Well, when I when I thought about this in prep, I I kind of put things into two different categories. I put things into the category of like what made me fascinated with movies. I think you're going to do at exactly a young age. What I did. And yeah. then I thought of things in another category was after I began that pursuit, yeah. what are things that kept me going? Yep. That I saw it and it was like, "Oh my god, I do want it. I, I as hard as this has been, I, maybe I dealt with rejection." This is this is in the vein of what I always wanted to do, you know. Yeah, so I, I would I would add a third category to that because I would the first category I also kind of split it into two. The first category was dead on with you uh, about like just young what fascinated you, and then I think when I kind of started considering the idea of it when I became a little older, like early twenties, what movies did I see, and I kind of thought realistically like i could see myself making a movie like mm -hmm. that like not only did i really enjoy it but that feels like something that i would be able to write yeah. about or make yeah you know and then i would say yeah that that third category would be one that i could definitely see like maybe not movies that i would make but that movie does inspire me and keep me going in a certain way yeah that's true because there are a lot of movies like that that aren't in my wheelhouse like i could never I could make. make inception no. I could never make Inception. No. Um, but that is one of my favorite movies of all time. And even though, you know, I think a lot of people think of that movie as being, you know, very complex plot and twists and turns and stuff like that. To me, it's one of the most inspiring movies uh, with the story about Leo wanting to get his kids back. And that ending to me is, it's definitely one of my favorite movie endings of all time with him waking up on the plane, the Hans Zimmer score yeah. swelling, and then him getting home, and then the top spinning, and you're not knowing. Like, yeah, that, that's just a movie that to me, and I know there's a lot of people that don't love Inception and say there's plot holes and stuff, and I agree. There are certain things that don't add up, inconsistencies or whatever, but just to me, I kind of just ignore that, and I just, I love every second of that movie, basically. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, in that category you just brought up, I would put like Tarantino movies. Yeah. Definitely. That's not my, that would never, when I sit down to write, those types of things don't come to mind. But I also, have you started reading the book? I got, not yet, the but I'm going to speculate. I mean, the, the movies that, look, it's out of the case I because, that, I, put, I, saw, because yeah. I put it in my backpack to read. So it's in the queue. Was, yeah. It's yeah, in the queue. Yeah. Uh, like his influences are like those B movies. Like yes. those, exploitation movies and like you know the sh the uh, the the westerns he's super influenced so all the stuff he's influenced by i like but it's not what i'm influenced by even though i'm influenced by his films yes i would not make a type of film like him what I, a film that i would make would be more like a movie like like shame with uh mm. michael foss mm -hmm. okay <laughs> Uh, <laughs> even uh, if that is the right way to say it there's something about it that sounds so pretentious yeah to i'm gonna keep saying, saying it that way. That way. no i think yeah. you're quite you're quite possibly he's right german irish i've just so. heard fastbender my whole life but but no it is just funny to say yeah um i've never seen shame i've seen the first like that oh isn't it the opening scene where they're like on the subway where and they he's see staring that girl down yeah i've seen someone sent me that scene oh, to watch dude. one time shame is so but good. i've never watched it it's a it's about a guy and it's not taken lightly at all the subject matter it's about a guy dealing with sex addiction and mm -hmm. but it's like there's nothing funny about it it's so mm -hmm. dark it's like it, it shows how this guy is like completely consumed by this and it has ruined his life mm -hmm. yeah um but that that is stuff that i'm more apt to make mm -hmm. whereas or like silly funny or like funny satirical stuff which you know you know, I guess Tarantino. He doesn't. Really wait, wait, wait. Anything. You're saying you're saying you wouldn't make something funny? No, I would. That's more of like the stuff I'm writing now is all sketches that but are you like said satirical. That shame is something you would see yourself making. Also, that. 
So those two types of things. Give me like a comedy that you think would be a movie comedy that you think would be close to something that you think you would make. A movie comedy? Yeah. Oh boy. I would say more I would more T V shows would come to mind. Sunny. Sunny and South Park. Like Mm -hmm. uh like a, a like a human version of South Park, which I think Sonny kind of is. Give me, give me some more movies in general, not a comedy, whatever. Another one. That I want to. I want you to come up with a movie that I've seen that feels like something you would make because I want American just Psycho. Into. Okay, that's yeah. something I could do because I really, I, I love satire. So you like the dark shit? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I love satire. I mean, um, and then also I loved all those '70s films, those dark '70s films, um, Raging out. Bull. Mm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Taxi Driver. Is there a uh, part of you? Um, all of uh, what's his name? Kubrick films. Uh, Let's dig into this a little bit because I'm, I'm trying to think about like the darkest movies that I love. I think for me, I genu- I usually need you know some hope at the end for yeah. me to not kind of feel like ah oh, whatever you know. Um, and I'm trying to remember. Taxi Driver ends right where he's in the car uh, talking, and I think Scorsese has said that. In his opinion, De Niro's going to have another like episode like he has where he kills the people. Mm. He says it's just like down the line. But I'm trying to think about... There's something interesting to me about... I have zero issue with dark subject matter. But I think when the movie ends still in just kind of a very dark place... Um, and it's not about dark. I'm not disturbed by violence or anything like that. I think it's just... I want to feel like I have closure in a way that satisfies me. I mean, you know? that's, I mean, um, any screenwriting book would, would suggest that's how you end your film. But it, it's but, hard to send audiences away, like, in dreariness. But, yeah, so have you seen Blue Valentine? Is that with Michelle Williams and Gosling? And Gosling. I have seen it. I don't know if I've seen the whole thing, and I don't. So, so I the way it ends it. is literally. I know they live together in preparation to. Oh, for the okay, film. yeah. So they, the movie ends. He goes to her job, and um, you know they have a big fight or whatever. And is and, it like a diner or something? A restaurant? No, no. She works at. I, I think. Oh, she works, I, it, she it, works at some kind of doctor's office. Yeah, or something, but I isn't think. he like balding by the end yeah, of the movie? Yeah. yeah. Well, so the movie the whole time is bouncing back and forth from present day. And then like the beginning of their relationship. Yeah. So you're seeing what their relationship has become, where it's just not happy at all. And what their relationship started as when they were young and it was so romantic and they were so in love and stuff like that. And um, the end scene is back in the present timeline. He goes into her office. I can't remember why. I think maybe he's he's kind of trying one last ditch effort. Like I'm going to surprise her at work with flowers or something like that. And it just doesn't go well yeah. at all. She's like, you can't just come into my work and you know, and it results in a fight that gets pretty heated. Then a guy from her work steps in to kind of try to settle things down. Yeah. He gets into a fight with the guy. I, I remember that scene punches the guy. And then, you know, uh, she's screaming, I hate you. And I think she like throws the wedding ring out into the woods that is like next to the parking lot. And then the movie just, ends with you know like it's over it's over and he just is walking down the street and then it just ends yeah and i guess you could make the argument that you know there's closure there's closure it's gonna be over you know there's could be hope there but like that dude for example derek c in france i think is his name he did that movie he did place beyond the pines and he did uh the sound of metal oh wow yeah place beyond the pines is fantastic yeah i think it's really underrated i think i'm not saying it's a perfect movie the thirds kind of i don't love but i think that might be like my favorite bradley cooper performance ever i remember walking out of the movie and being like bradley cooper just destroyed that movie yeah bradley cooper Um, is a a titan amongst men um (laughs) he is he's really one of the best well so uh but so two more movies that i would say that came to mind when you asked that question are birdman and network are two Hmm. kinds of movies that i I would love network ends Network ends with that voiceover after uh, Howard Beale has been killed by the extremists. It says, this is the story of Howard Beale, the only man in the history of television who was killed due to low ratings. (laughs) So, but see, like Birdman's... Birdman ends with hope. Yeah, because well, at the end there's that that like some people surrealist- say that he dies though, right? Or because there's suicide or some shit. I don't know. There's a lot of interpretation. Uh, well, it's, it's, I remember a lot of interpretation around. Nobody can Birdman. say definitively what happens because Martin it's Scorsese. Like, yeah, 
<laughs> Martin Scorsese. I love dude. Uh, Zach Galifianakis. He kills it. So in that that's movie. the type of movie that I would love to make. Something that's yeah. like funny. Yeah. Uh, has serious subject matter. Yeah. Uh, definitely d- the one shot aspect of it. I love. Yeah. And Birdman. Crazy. Birdman's one of my favorite movies, and so is Network Both and American Psycho. So those are three movies that off the top of my head. I think it's All my favorite th- Edward Norton performance ever. Oh yeah, he's, he's fantastic. In that movie. And Michael Keaton. Every, it's but it's just great. You know what's amazing? Sorry to distract. I just want to bring yeah. this up before I forget. But I remember when I saw Birdman. I understand that Edward Norton's character is ridiculous in a lot of ways in that movie but also before you know that he's ridiculous he's kind of the straight man to an extent like he's just the good actor guy um and i remember i was like i don't know how to explain it but just he's stealing every single scene well every single scene like like because think about think about this this is this is a scene that always blew my mind in that movie that movie's amazing but so you know how he comes up to keaton and he's like Oh, let's just run it. Let's just let's just go. And yeah. and he's like, well, I don't have the script. And he's like, no, it just it just works. Just, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and then he's like, you know, you know and, my lines. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that the whole point is they're gonna rehearse the scene, and basically the joke is it's amazing when they rehearse the scene because the whole thing is that it's not working with the other guy. Right. Edward Norton does it, and then yeah. they get done, and Edward Norton goes like that, and it has to be. That they're back and forth, you feel wow, this yeah. is good. Yeah, for that punchline of him shrugging at the end to work. Yeah, and it's just it's kind of I, I remember having that realization when I watched it. I'm like, that's wild to think like we just have to make this back and forth that we do for about 20 seconds feel awesome, mm-hmm. and everyone has to be invested for this punchline to work. Yeah, and it's just that's how good he is, <laughs> you know, yeah. like because because there's nothing crazy happening in the scene or anything. It's just their chemistry when they do it is amazing. And then you're like, oh, my God. Yeah, he needs to be the guy. Yeah. You know, and then he shrugs and then the whole theater laughs. Yeah. No, I mean, it, you you have to be like an all time great actor to, to pull that off because it's one. Th- the veil has already been lifted because we know you're acting. Yeah. So you have to act well without the veil the the trick that usually is provided by TV and film, which is that you know you're tr- trying to trick the audience into believing that this is just happening, right? But you've let them in on the fact this is like a behind the scenes, uh, a making of theater. So mm-hmm. you're like, it's so, it's one thing to be like the the parlor trick of acting is 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 you know that's a talent in and of itself, but to be like, all right, everybody, this is acting. Yeah. And then you still make people believe yeah. what they just saw. That's yeah. a whole other level. Dude, I just think that movie is like, if you are in the entertainment industry at all, and especially at that time, I was super into theater. That's what I was doing. I was doing theater classes. Um, and the and then it brings in the superhero stuff, which is, I mean, that movie is two, 2015. And even then they were talking about the outstretched nature of, of the superheroes and uh, how like blockbuster people are generally sh- Hollywood shitty actors can't come to New York and do Broadway and stuff like that, um, and and also I everybody knows it's it's not it's not one shot. Oh yeah, but I mean from a technical yeah, it's that, awesome. that just so and and the whole one shot thing adds into the, the the nature of the film. It's not like it's not like the one shot thing is like a gimmick that mm-hmm. doesn't really roll into the rest of the theme. It's, of course, it's done in one shot. Yeah, you know, because that's what theater is. Yeah. Theater is one take. Yeah, you know, whereas film, you get to break it up and you can say two words at a time. Film, uh, t- theater, it's in the raw. Yeah, you know, and I love, I well, I love doing theater, and you know, um, yeah. Um, I but also, I would say the thing about steen, scene stealing, I it, it's a thing that people say a lot, like oh, like like uh, and there'll be blood it's like oh like daniel day lewis just ate up the screen you didn't even know paul dano was there it's like is paul dano supposed to just like you know go off script and start being someone well, like he's supposed to be this impish pathetic like guy that is juxtaposed with the the super dark and so, powerful daniel day lewis daniel plainview character and it's like you know i, I at that time i remember with there'll be blood it was like people were like 
oh man, Paul Dano just like totally gets like just walked all. Well, there's a scene where Daniel Day Lewis literally slaps him around and pushes his face in the mud. It's like, yeah, of course so, you're gonna have the perception that that guy is okay, more powerful. So, so, but that's kind of what my point was, and so maybe me saying scene stealing was maybe not the way that I wanted to present it. But here's what, because I've talked with other people about this. Uh, and I don't know if it's because I've taken a lot of acting classes. So now when I watch movies, I'm always like subconsciously judging acting. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think what's fascinating to me is when I feel like someone is quote unquote scene stealing or seems to me doing the best acting when they're not the big character. Yeah. And I, I think that's kind of the point I was trying to make when I said that he's the straight man for a lot of it. Um, is I know he has like the ridic- there's like the ridiculous boner joke and stuff like that with his character and He's stuff like that. It's fairly outrageous. But, I mean, he gets naked and but, like but tries to Keaton's have sex. But his character with- is more emotional for a lot of the movie. And so, you know, like another movie, I, I doubt you've seen this, but maybe you have. Have you seen Blue Jay? It's Blue a Jay. Mark Duplass movie. No. Uh, it's Mark Duplass and Sarah Paulson. That's the fir- the main one that comes to mind for me because I remember being blown away by her, how good she is in that movie. The movie's okay, I'd give it like a B. Um, it's usual Duplass shit, kind of like that mumblecore improv stuff that I think is kind of boring and annoying a lot of times, but she's amazing in it. But the reason that I find it interesting is his character is 100% the bigger character mm-hmm. in the movie. It's literally like a bit throughout the movie that she has no emotion. Like okay. she doesn't cry, like she doesn't do anything. She's just like doesn't care about anything. But still, and they're equally the leads. It's not like she's the lead. I was still... And his character is really emotional and is always screaming and losing his shit. And I was fascinated by her in yeah. every scene. Um, and so I think that's what's the most impressive to me is when someone isn't the big character. They're not doing the Heath Ledger Joker, but they still feel like, damn, he's just so good. Honestly, Downey Jr. and Oppenheimer, I would kind of say oh, that for. But like, like yeah. there, there, There's like a presence that they have where I'm just like, God, I, it's hard for me. If you haven't seen Oppenheimer... It's hard for me to explain why Downey Jr. is so good in it. All I know is I'm watching it and I'm just saying this is amazing. Robert Downey Jr. though is one of those people that it's just like, I forget, Keisha and I were watching something and we were like, well, I don't know if I want to say who it was because it could compromise her business wise, but there's this, uh, there's this person coming out with this new film and it's like attached to an album and you're just, it's a person of huge gravitas within society and everything, but like their acting is like so vacant. And the mm-hmm. thing is, is like, I think you, as an actor, like you really have to want to make it real and honest in every scene. Mm-hmm. Like you can't just be there. And it's very obvious, especially if you've, if you've been in an acting class, you can tell the people who are like timidly reading the lines mm-hmm. and then the people who, the lines are just there because they're that person right now. And Robert Downey Jr. is just one of those people. And one of the things, he's, ne- he's never gone to an acting class or anything. Oh, I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. His dad. Uh, I, I know his family was in the business. Yeah. So that's like how that, he but. just, he, his dad was a big, like, um, you know, East Village, New York City, independent film director guy. I want to see that doc, by the way. Have oh, you yeah, seen yeah. that? No, I haven't. I it haven't. looked amazing. Yeah, and I think it got amazing reviews. Um, but he said he's like what I learned when I was just watching, you know, my dad's movies on set. He's like the people who were best were just simply the ones who like were the most real. Mm. And he goes, the people that weren't doing like extra theatrical kind of stuff mm. and the people who like were in the scene and they were just real. And he's like, so my acting philosophy is like, I just try to be as real as I can in every scene. You know, what's really funny. I've heard I've listened to a lot of interviews with him, actually, because you know, one, I think we've talked about it, that show off camera with Sam Jones. Yeah, his, um, yeah he's good. He's been it. on there twice. And I think it was in one of those interviews that he said it. He, he's just done a good amount of acting interviews and I always enjoy them. Like he's been on Rogan also. But he said that on set, like one of his jokes that he would do all the time <laughs> is like he would literally, and it's, it's kind of fucked up, but he said his intention was not to fuck people up. It was to just kind of remind people like, we're just making a movie. Yeah. Like this is supposed to be fun. Like you don't put too much pressure on yourself. Yeah. But he said like, 
it would be like before a big scene where everybody was kind of feeling the pressure and they would be like, all right, lights, you know, like literally it's four seconds before they're going to say action. And he would <laughs> yeah. go, does anyone need anything from the store? <laughs> like just say something like that. <laughs> and it's great. so dumb, but it's pretty funny. And especially cause that moment when everyone's getting <laughs> yeah. ready to shoot and you're like camera like, sound and it, it, uh, it, it feels like, Oh my God, and, here and, we go. And like a scene that he's probably the main focal right. point in. So it's like the idea that he's going to the, store yeah. <laughs> like, he's just gonna make where if you don't know it's coming the director's probably like what the fuck is he talking about yeah. he's doing the scene that's great that's but, a hilarious you know it's another funny one i heard jeff bridges say this i don't know what movie he was talking about it shows my lack of film history the big but, lebowski is another type of movie i'd like to make yeah i was yeah. gonna bring that up actually but uh jeff bridges was doing a movie with kevin bacon and um i think Jeff that was before a big emotional type scene or a big scene that jeff bridges was nervous about and uh and Kevin Bacon was like, hey, guys, everyone um, get in here for a second. And like brought in like all the actors and they get in a circle and he goes, all right, guys, now remember, he goes, everything depends on this. <laughs> you know, and it's just so dumb. But it's yeah. but it, Jeff Bridges said it was like a great way to cut the tension and just like made everybody laugh. And yeah, that is kind of a really cool um thing like you know just to remind yourself about it's like you want to take it seriously you want to work super super hard but at the end of the day if you're putting so much pressure on yourself that you're not even having fun then what is the point of doing it um but he's also someone that seems like a cool guy anytime i've seen him in any kind of interviews like that is kevin bacon yeah um i mean that's the vibe that tarantino tries to create on set i'm sure you've heard about Mm -hmm. you know you're 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 obviously doing some pretty serious stuff at times but he keeps like a pretty fun loose set with music in between and there's lots of jokes and you can't have your phone. So you got to talk to people and shit like that. I think that's, I mean, I think that's as a filmmaker or anybody producing something, I think that's of the (coughs) utmost importance is to create an environment. That's like, you enjoy being in. I have a phenomenal story that I'm almost positive. I've never told you. And I think it's one of my favorite behind the scenes stories ever. Yeah. So I heard this cause I watched Josh, a Josh Brolin interview where he was on, I can't remember if it was Hot Ones, but I watched one of his interviews. Oh, is this about the Cohen brothers? Bro. Where he, the line? Yes. Where he's like, shouldn't he say something yeah. when he opens the briefcase? Or, like, <laughs> dude. And they're like, what? Well, hold on. Let's, let's just, <laughs> oh, okay. I'll, I'll tell it yeah. for this because it's so funny. So if you've ever seen No Country for Old Men, there's a scene where Josh Brolin opens up a suitcase, not knowing what's in it, and it's just a bunch of money. And he doesn't say anything in the script. And so Josh Brolin is shooting the scene, and I don't remember if it was Joel or Ethan Cohen, but let's say it's Ethan, whatever. I think Ethan is the one that made the joke. Okay, so yeah. Josh Brolin says to Ethan, he's like, shouldn't he say something? Like, shouldn't there be a reaction to opening this and seeing a bunch of money? And he's like, well, you want him to say a, a word? And Josh Brolin's like, well, no, maybe not a word, but, you know, just kind of like a, like a, and like, like, like a grunt. And Ethan was like, okay, yeah, that's pretty good. But like, what else? Like, what, what, else? what else could he make? Yeah. And he's like, oh. You know, or, or, yeah, and, hmm? yeah and then, he's like, oh, and, I like, that. yeah, and then he did a bunch of different grunts, and then Ethan says, oh yeah, I like, I, I, like, I like that, that one. one. <laughs> so then they do the scene. So and Josh, Bro- so they do the scene, and Josh Brolin opens the money, and he goes, mm-hmm. and uh, and he he never knew if Ethan Cohen was fucking with him or not, but then when they would be at premieres. He said that he always knew where Ethan was sitting because whenever he would do that, mm, he would just hear him <laughs> dying laughing wherever he was in the movie yeah. theater. And I'm like, that is the best story. But I like ever. how Josh Brolin at the end of the story, he's like, "What was was? Did it add anything to the scene? I don't know. Was he fucking with me? Maybe." And it's like, it's so great that like instead of that's such a better way to handle like an annoying actor thing than to just get but annoyed. You know, I it's gotta, like to I gotta cut- be honest. I remember, I swear, I remember watching that movie for the first time as a teenager. You know, I think I was 18. And that grunt, as dumb as it sounds, like, I like it. I feel like it fits his character. Uh, yeah. I feel like that does work better than silence for me. Because it's like, that character would be like, have yeah. kind of an aw shucks, huh, attitude about that. Y- you know? Yeah, but because I do feel like silence i i don't want silence like i'm trying to think what i would do in that situation i think i would probably there would be a reaction there would with be like a verbal my reaction. my eyes yeah. or my mouth opening or like something Holy I, shit. I'm, I'm not just gonna yeah. look at it blank faced no that character might look at it blank faced but i do think the audible grunt does add a little it does something. it is I, th- I just think it's funny 
It, it's just a funny story. Yeah, you for know? sure. And I shouldn't say it's an annoying actor thing. No, I, I hear they're not all Well, there's a million annoying actors, but I don't predict that Josh Brolin is no, one No, I don't suspect that at all from what I've heard from him. He's another guy. I kind of want to dig into these performances that are, you know, not the leads of movies and maybe not the biggest character, but just they crush. He kills it in Sicario. I know everyone talks about Benicio, um, but Josh Brolin in Sicario is phenomenal. Yeah, and I as don't, like an understated, just grounded, real performance. It's not one of my favorite uh, Paul Thomas Anderson movies, but his performance well, a, in Inherent Vice is. Oh, uh, okay, gotcha. I thought you were gonna say Paul Thomas Anderson. Did no, what uh, that is. Um, Taylor Sheridan wrote it. I don't think he directed it. Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember, dude. I think he I don't might, think Taylor I, Sheridan directed it. No, I think it's Denis. Yeah, I think it's Denis Villeneuve. Or yeah, whatever yeah. You say his last name. Yeah, I think so. Um, what were you saying? Uh, what, 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 you were saying Inherent Vice. You loved uh, Josh. Do you remember his, I've never seen Inherent Vice. Oh, he he because I've heard it wasn't good. And it's I never, and I don't love PTA already. Like I think he's amazing, but he's not my favorite taste. Yeah, like there's only a couple of his movies that I personally love. Um, and so whenever everybody was saying it's not good, I'm like, well, if huge PTA fans don't even like this one. I'm not. Gonna it's like it. hard to follow because it. Well, it's based on a book from um, the same author that Tarantino adapted uh, Jackie Brown from. Mm. Uh, what's that guy's name? Shoot. Anyway, um, he tried to make it like the novel exactly in the sense that you're following an unreliable narrator. Because uh, 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 Joaquin Phoenix's character is like this private detective that is stoned all the time and it's in the sixties mm. or seven sixties. So they're like hippies living on the beach in some, is it funny at all? That movie? It is funny. There's part that are funny, but the problem is, is that, and my friend pointed this out is like, you don't know what's going on, but because the problem is, is that you're, it's through the lens of this guy who's the private detective who doesn't know what's going on. He's always mm. two steps behind. So <laughs> the plot is moving forward, but it's not like, <laughs> The guy who you're following is not aware of what's going on. He's yeah, unreliable. I mean, I and like things that. happen, like a character will show up at his house <laughs> out of nowhere, and you're like, is this an acid flashback or are you actually experiencing it? So it, it on is paper, a confusing movie. It sounds movie like a follow. cool idea, though. It's a confusing movie to follow. But the point but Josh Brolin is a great juxtaposition to uh, Joaquin Phoenix's character in mm. that movie. He does a great job. And kind of to your point, almost steals. Like, I think in what you're talking about, having a smaller role that kind of steals the show. He Even though it. you're kind of the more, quote unquote, normal one. Right. He's definitely the more normal one. Yeah. He's a straight, buzz, flat top, buzz uh, cut cop from the 60s who doesn't like any of the hippie stuff. Um, and he's, yeah, he's definitely more the straight man to Joaquin and Phoenix, who is a little uh, pretty out there. Um, yeah. Another that made me think the Coen brothers, though, there's a lot of Coen brother movies, I think, would be in the vein of something I would like to make. Mm. That are like they're pretty stripped down movies. They're mm -hmm. uh, a lot about ca the character. Um, it's pretty character driven. I'm trying like, to think if like the Big Lebowski. I love I love that movie, and that that's something that I would love. I love those kind of characters, like a like a Joaquin Phoenix in that Inherent Vice or the Big Lebowski. Those dude type characters that are just kind of. <laughs> Taking her, what does uh, Sam Elliott say? He's like, it's good to know the dudes out there taking it easy for all us sinners, you know? <laughs> I, I'm trying to think. I think No Country for Old Men is my favorite Coen Brothers movie. I'm trying to think if there's anything I like more than that. There's a lot of Coen Brothers movies that people don't really like that I I really enjoy. Like, what, like okay, so. Like A Serious Man, I really like, even though. Mm -hmm. Never seen that one. That's Michael Stuhlberg. He's like a professor or something, and his wife is having an affair. Mm. Um, no Country for Old Men is just like... I think the most impressive thing about that movie to me is how many scenes there are of people being totally alone and not talking to anyone, but the scenes being really engaging. Well, anytime like, you got Anton Chigurh in the room and there's silence, it's like deafening. But, yeah, but but also, I mean, like... What I think about where the scenes that I would have been self-conscious about being boring if I was writing that script would be when Josh Brolin is by himself, like in the hotel room, like mm -hmm. putting the stuff in the vent and all that stuff. But I think it's really cool how he's not talking that whole time, but everything he's doing, it's like you're seeing it. You're like, oh, you're wait, what's he doing? Oh, he's going to put it in the vent. Oh, yeah. And he's got to put get both rooms. So well, get, you, it's like no one's saying anything and you're just watching him in silence for what's you know 
I'm sure is much longer than most movies have scenes that are silent. And you're kind of just, yeah, yeah. And there's like this layer of anxiety because you feel like you're the guy in the situation, you know? And if I was writing that, I know I would have been very nervous about, oh, is this going to be fucking boring just watching well, it's, this guy it's, by himself? It's almost like music in the sense that the 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 moment or the the beats where you're not playing any sound is just as significant mm. to the sound. Uh, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's just as significant to the song as the, the the notes played. Yeah. Like the silence in No Country for Old Men is filled. There is no, in it, sure, there's no, uh, there's no audible, like there's, no, but you're, you're watching a very full moment. Yeah. I mean, you're what it's so good because I think it gives the audience a chance to feel like what they would be doing if they were on the run. Yeah. That's how I feel when I'm watching that movie. Cause you're, you're, I mean, you're, he's not, he, in the most simplistic form, it's him. It's, it's a monster story. Like he's running away from the monster and God, we've all had that feeling of like, even, you know, even that, like there's that Seinfeld episode where he pretends to like, He's like, you know, sometimes oh, I like to pretend yeah. that someone's chasing me in the yeah. hallway and I have to open up yeah. my mic. Everybody has done that. And you feel like, oh, my God, what would I be doing in those moments? Like, yeah, OK, I guess you would have to figure out a way to stash this money. And like, you know, you'd have to like be on the lamb and you have to wouldn't couldn't be able to use. Well, it's further back. I don't know. They could trace credit cards then. But you know what I mean? Yeah. And you, so the silence is filled with what you're going through as an audience member. I think that movie is just like. That is pretty close to a perfect movie. And it's really cool how um, it's really cool how he's not a genius. He's not, not at all. He's, he's a regular guy. But he's pretty smart. Yeah. Like street it, smart. It, it feels like he's just a little smarter than what I would do. He's, like like when he's putting it in the vent, it's not like he's a brilliant genius, but I'm like, God damn, that's smart. You're gonna get both rooms, you're gonna put the money in the vent in between the two rooms. There, you know, just he does things like that throughout the movie that make you feel well you know. it, it's because i mean he's it's like i think that like that dark or that the what would you say cuz if he's dumber than you then you're like why are you fucking doing well, this that, but then if he's james bond and is perfect then, it, then you're not There's worried no about threat, it There's right, no anxiety yeah. you know he but i think every, it shows that when your back is up against the wall you'd be surprised what you what can, you can figure out of, yeah. it, when your life is on the line and you're on the run from anton Chigurh. i mean I think that's what's so brilliant about that movie. Sure, he's he's probably sharper than the average. He's definitely sharp, better, smarter than the average guy. Yeah. But he is still just like this average guy who's on the run from this monster. Yeah. And he's he's staying one step ahead. Yeah. Is, the, until he's not. The part of the movie that I think I remember having the biggest impact on me the first time I watched it, I remember watching it with my dad. You know, it was on you know HBO or whatever. I didn't see it in the theater, but I remember watching it in the living room with my dad. And I, I was, I think, again, I think I was 18 or whatever, and we're just watching it in the living room, and the scene where he's sitting on the hotel bed with the shotgun, and you see the footsteps come up to the door, and then walk away, and then the hallway light goes yeah. off. I just remember out loud going, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, just, just that I have moment, chills right now. <laughs> that moment where you're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> like um, it's about to but go it's down. funny because th- that that is the opposite that ending is the opposite of what you talked about earlier that you well liked. so i do love that movie but i because that, e- that ends with tommy lee jones basically throwing his hands up in the air who i mean tommy lee jones in that movie is like the moral compass yeah and I, it's at the end of the movie it's him basically being like i i don't have any place in this world because it's 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 too it's too dark for me yeah yeah, you know, and so I don't. I love the Tommy Lee Jones monologue, and I know this is probably I don't know very because it's I don't, him. I don't know if it's American or what it is about me, but there I, I'd be lying if I said that there's not a part of me that even if artistically it's the better, more interesting choice, but just the fact that Brolin just dies the way he does, and you know they don't kill Shigor or whatever. There is a part of me that's like fuck. I want him to get that motherfucker, you know? Yeah, but um, I mean, it ends with Tommy Lee Jones talking to his wife, basically being like, he, he tells that story about that dream. Yeah, what is the dream again? Um, it's I, I remember he's talking about it, and then he says, and then I woke up. And then up, I woke up, and that know? was the end of the movie. Yeah. Um, but it's basically about kind of being hopeless. Yeah. I, I, that, that was the gist of it, as, uh, as I recall. But uh, And then he has that story, or he has that, uh, what is it, his uncle or his brother that he's the guy who like lives in squalor with all the cats and he's talking yeah. to him 
and he's talking about like he, he's like, oh, I heard you're quitting, and he's like, yeah, you know, just this isn't for me, and, he, and basically he said the world's changing and it ain't waiting for you. Yeah, and it, I mean that movie ends with like the the notion is the world is getting darker, and it's a really cool thought though. Fun. I know it's sad, but that is that is a. I don't want to say cool. It's a profound message. Just yeah. this idea of, okay, the world's getting super dark, so I'm scared. I'm not going to play justice hero fighter anymore. I'm going to hole up in my house and just try to live. And it's you know? just like I've I've reached the end of my – he's retired. He's older. Yeah, um, yeah fantastic. What are uh, – do you remember – the conception of when you realized that like acting was a where you you went from just watching things as a little kid and being like oh what's this crazy thing on the tv and yeah. you'd be fascinated with that or at the movies do you remember the transition from that to understanding that acting was like that these people were actors and that you were oh. that it's a job interesting um i mean i think i understood that at a pretty young age um cuz i i mean i think I remember being a kid and my parents explaining it to me, you know what I'm talking about yeah. or whatever. So I think I knew that at a pretty young age, but I think you still don't like fully connect the dots in the sense that I had no idea logistically about how a movie is made right. or that James Bond isn't really James Bond in the sense that he's not maybe that super cool guy. He yeah. might be a nerd, you yeah. know, uh, or, you know, Probably the movie that I watched the most as a child, I was obsessed with Sandlot. Like I just oh, thought I love that movie. Benny the Jet was yeah. the coolest I, I, kid yeah. ever, you know, yeah. and I wanted to be him and all this stuff. And so even though I think I knew, I knew they were actors, there wasn't an understanding of the sense of, oh, when you shoot something this way, when you put music to it, when you edit it, it makes these people seem way cooler than they yeah. actually are. You know, um, so I think I had zero understanding of acting as a process or the logistics of movie making, but I think I did know at a base level, okay, they're standing in front of a camera and they're recording this. This is make-believe. But I think I still kind of thought that who the people were pretending to be in the movie was kind of who they were in real right, life. Like right. like Benny the Jet was a super cool yeah, kid yeah, walking yeah. around the real world. Yeah, yeah. Like he was probably the most popular, like in my head, he was the most popular kid at his high school and he was awesome at baseball. You yeah, know? Like and I that's think why I, he's doing this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. yeah. I think for me, it was the first time I realized, well, I had that experience with this, I, and it's an obscure movie. It's a kid's movie that I doubt many people, but there was this movie called The Three Ninjas. Bro. Yes. You know Three Ninjas? Yeah, bro. Oh, dude. I remember there was- So you're was, talking about the original, or you're talking about Knuckle, Knuckle Up, up or you're talking no, about I'm talking about the original, the original. You have no idea how much it scarred me to my core that Colt loses a fight to the girl oh, and kick back. I, I didn't bro. see kick back. I saw Knuckles Up. Oh, my but God. When the, I've never seen Knuckle Up. The three, the original three ninjas. Yeah. There was a part of me that was just like, I remember when I was a little, little kid and I remember being in my room and being literally devastated that I was not a part of that little, that I wasn't one of their brothers. Cause I was just like these fuck, they go and they study karate with their Japanese grandfather. And then they can, th these kids can just beat up these intruders. And like, you know, I, 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 I literally remember who being, was your favorite. I don't. I don't remember them to that degree. Rocky, Tum Tum, -tum or Colt? Colt's the middle one. Tum Tum was the short, fat one. I think one the older ate. one is the Rocky. One. Yeah. I think. I feel Did like he the has the blue popular. bandana. No. The blue thing? No. Colt was blue. He was the. Then it was one. Colt. Everyone's favorite was Colt. That was yeah. the point I was trying to make. Oh, okay. He was the middle one that had an edge to him. Yes, he was yes, troubled. Yes, he yes, was yes, emotional. Yes. Rocky was like the good, good right. that had the girlfriend. Yeah. Tum Tum was the short, fat comedic right, relief. Right. Um, but I think but, every I think ninety percent of people Colt was their favorite. Yeah, it was the one with the blue. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But dude, I was so sad that I was that wasn't my life. And I re, I th I remember my mom having to like talk to me <laughs> and be like Brett. She called me Bretty when I was. You know, Bretty, these they're not really you know that's not really what's going on. Yeah. And so, I remember her like breaking it down for me, and I'm going, huh. They're, mm. they're, they don't go to ninja camp every mm. summer. Like I, I didn't, I didn't. And, and that hurt, but it, it made me feel better because I, I, I was so devastated that I wasn't one of those brothers and I was never going to have a life like that. And then when she told me that about acting and stuff, I was, it made me think like, Oh wait, so like I could do 
any job and just pretend I could pretend to have any job. I could be a cop, a lawyer, a ninja, whatever. And then I became fat. And then I remember my grandma used to watch Seinfeld in syndication. Mm -hmm. And my grandma only had one channel. Mm -hmm. She had CBS. And Seinfeld would come on in syndication. So we would watch Seinfeld together. And I remember her explaining to me, like, about who Jerry Seinfeld was. And, and like, that is sort of his life, how he mm. does the comedy stuff at the beginning. And, like, uh, you know, and then she told me, you know, the show isn't even in New York City. Like, they go somewhere else to shoot it. And I was just like, so, the, and maybe by that time I was, like, eight or nine or something. And I remember thinking, like, Oh, that's because Seinfeld was another thing where I was saddened that that wasn't my life, where I was like, God, I really just want to live in New York City and have my friends stop by my apartment and have a diner that we all go to and stuff like that. And then I remember thinking, oh, well, I guess that could be my life, too. I could have that. That could that's another job. And then it may, then at that point, I watch movies fully from the understanding that these are people making a movie. Yeah. But uh there at the beginning it was just like this magical world that i'm not a part of and it makes me really sad and then when you find out that like well no it is actually just a job that yeah. you could go get then i was kind of that i think that kind of set my course in my life yeah it's funny because even you know i've t i talked to katie about this all the time uh there is a thing about shows like a, the king of queens is another one that i think of that's a really good example for what you were talking about with the seinfeld because like i love that show and um, I love Seinfeld too, but I like King of Queens a lot. There's something fun or interesting about mundane problems, and I get it. Seinfeld is more comedic than real life, and King of Queens is too. But they're stuck in these mundane problems. But there's like an, a sense of adventure to it, mm -hmm. and you know, I've never been to New York, and it's like Doug is a truck wait, driver. Wait a second, you've never been? I've to never New York been to New York. So, okay. so Doug is a truck driver. He's a fucking UPS driver, basically in Queens, and. You know, they don't have a lot of money. They no. live in Queens. But there is something that is charming and fun oh, about yeah. the show. So then you're like, man, I could be happy just being a fucking truck driver <laughs> yeah. in Queens, you know? Yeah. And you're like, that life would suck oh, in yeah. reality. You'd be but, miserable. But you're like, oh, oh God, I married a, a, a FedEx driver I, in I Queens. I married a hot ass Leah Remini back yeah. in the day. Um, she had her spicy attitude. Oh, yeah. um, and then and then you got and, and then, then you have like your friends that come over and, and you're just Jerry like a Stiller guy that watch. Dad. Yeah. And he then you just great. watch football. You know, he's just like a bro, like a guy. And yes, I think so. I think I dealt with that same thing with Seinfeld as well, where it's like, even though they're on a set, you know, when they're this out exterior shots where they're always walking down New yeah. York City streets and there's always like some hijinks yeah. going on or whatever. It just always feels fun. Yeah. Even when it's mundane problems, you know, they're dealing with a dentist appointment issue or some shit, but yeah, the show always feels like, yeah, I wish I was just in New York with my friends and yeah. we always had these little adventures we're dealing with and stuff. And it's just like, oh, and man. Scheming these, and stuff. Yeah, these cool like New York people who go to movies and are cultured. They just but hang out at problems, a diner. But then these problems aren't fun in real life. Like, for example, one episode that I love is, God, I'm trying to remember if it's George or Jerry. One of them, who is it that leaves the voicemail on some, on their George. girlfriend's machine and then sneaks in and, and then they're trying, so that is a super exciting episode with them trying to and jerry's trying to distract her and everything but in real life if that happened that would be such a miserable stressful experience trying yeah. to get rid of the tape before she comes back well, and stuff think about do you, do you did you see the episode where where george wants to have an affair with marissa tomei yes yes that that is <laughs> As, when I got older, that became like my favorite episode because like I'm like, episode. George is is asking his friends to participate in his like <laughs> affair and thinks nothing of it. When it, when Elaine is like, no, I'm not going to set you up. And he, she, he's like, why? A, a, a cup of coffee. She's like, because you're engaged. He's like, oh, it's just something you say. <laughs> what is engaged? What is engaged? It's just something you say. And then... Um, yeah, that, and then when like when Susan asks him, she's like, "So, let me, what what does Art Vandelay uh, export?" And he's like, "Matches, <laughs> matches. big long matches." Just punches him. Yeah, but well, that's a serious problem. He's yeah. asking. He's all of his friends are involved in a scheme that he is perpetrating to go have an affair with Marissa Tomei, and he's she loves short, stocky, bald men. He's like, "I know you threw short in there." <laughs> he's like, well, "Yeah, whatever." <laughs> Oh man, that but, George! Well, you, know what I, you know what I think it is. George it's, has serious problems. But here's really. what makes it fun: 
here's why it's fun. On a TV show that you know for a fact is a comedy, the idea of real negative consequences does not exist. No. Which is why it allows us to exist in this world as a fun thing. Yeah, not network. There are now yeah, yeah, yeah. more dramedy kind of like yeah, uh, yeah. what's his but, name? Uh, but but in that time period, yeah, right? no, it, was it always, didn't matter what happened. It was eleven. A sense I of levity. understand this, so that's why I can just laugh at it. There's no pressure. I can just focus on the absurdly funny aspects yeah. of it. I because I know there's no pressure that the girlfriend's gonna find the voicemail message get super sad and cry and it's going to break your heart and be gut-wrenching. Yeah. I know that's not going to happen. So with all those things out, with with the idea of any real negative consequence ever happening that's going to be anything other than funny, then yes, that you can exist in that yeah. world and, and just be a scheming piece of shit. Yeah, also, like, I think you, credit has to be given to those actors and the fact that Larry David is involved. Like, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, even though he's not like the best network, uh, next ne best comedic actor of yeah. ever by any stretch of the imagination, um, his his levity that he brought to it, there was no situation that was heavy. Yeah, you know, you never felt like there was situations that, if they, like you said, if they were in real life, would be heavy. Yeah, you know, but like, uh, because Jerry is such like. They even address it in Seinfeld when when uh, they're like, yeah, Jerry, never, you never really get mad. Your voice just kind of reaches a comedic pitch. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, about. and so, and also uh, when they pitched Seinfeld, the, their their motto was, the show is going to have no hugs, uh, no lessons. And mm. uh, the way it was like, oh, no hugs, no feelings, no lessons. Mm. Um, which obviously there's feelings and stuff yeah. like that. And, but like, yeah, Seinfeld, man, uh, that definitely shaped my life, and it's definitely a big part of the reason that I went to New York City. I mean, not a big part. I mean, I would say close to 100% of the reason why I moved to New York City and wanted to become an actor, and and then I got into comedy, and it was... And I, actually, this college I went to, it, I mean, the big part of it was one of the only ones I got into, but it was also where Jerry first went to college. Oh, that's cool. He transferred out of there, but Oswego, the... State University of New York at Oswego. <laughs> he went there for like two semesters and then dropped out. I mean, bro, Entourage was one of the main reasons I moved to LA. Entourage I, was and, definitely. And, and yeah. you know, that's an example where it's like, even as adults, even though we know we're acting, I think it's very easy because Kevin Connolly, I've heard him talk about this in uh, a lot of interviews where he says that, you know, people always would come up to him during the shooting of the show and they were like, bro, it's got to be the best job ever. And he goes, admittedly, he goes, it was easily the most fun acting job I've ever had. He was like, because we were all friends. Yeah. Like, it was loose. It was a fun show. Yeah, it was popular. Like, all this stuff. And then he goes, but also, it was still a job. Yeah. And there were long hours. Yeah. And he goes, and it's like, and I'm not hooking up with all these girls. No. <laughs> you know, like, oh, like uh, Emmanuel Shrieky is not my girlfriend. Right. You know, like, all this stuff. Like, I get to, like, I don't own this Aston Martin. Right. I don't live in this mansion. Yeah. You know, like, all these things. So... He well, admits that it was the most fun acting job ever, but it is like, we, you know, even knowing it's acting, I think basically everyone in college that loved that show when it was at its prime watched it and was like, oh my God, these guys have just got the best life. And it's oh, like, yeah. well, their real lives are not nearly as good as this life that's being portrayed on yeah. this show. What's his name? Jerry Ferraro? Turtle? Yeah. Uh-huh. He, 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 he was living in Van Nuys for the first two seasons. Damn. So could you imagine that? Dri 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 <laughs> driving from Van Nuys to yeah. wherever they shot that, and then to dr and then go back home to yeah. Van Nuys but after I, you've experienced that. But I'll say this: not that Van Nuys is. I think I could deal with it because the other thing that's cool that Kevin Connolly said, he said, and I've heard Jonah Hill talk about this was super bad. He said the next day after the season, the series premiere, my life had completely changed. He goes, I went into a Seven Eleven the next morning. And everybody yep. was looking at me. And he goes, and, and he had been acting for a long time before that, since a kid, and never had been treated like that. And it was like he went into 7 Eleven, and it was like, people are like, bro, I, that show you're on. Yeah. And, and, you know, and uh, I've heard Jonah Hill talk about that was super bad, that it premieres Friday night, Saturday morning. He's walking down the street, and like everybody's yelling at him. Yeah. I mean, Entourage captures that the, the whole like your life could turn around at any minute here. Yeah. I, I, I still think, in my opinion, it's, I hesitate to say my favorite show of all time, but I think 
And for me, my own personal taste, it is the most fun show of all time because it's so about the business and it's so fun and it's so, it's just easy. Like yeah. it's, it's, and I don't mean easy that there's zero weight because they do have their dramatic moments and stuff. It's not as light as something like Seinfeld, but it does, it is just, it's a topic that I'm in, you know, the thing that I'm most passionate about and the, all, the Jeremy Piven's amazing and, and just the the bromance of the guys like their chemistry I truly think is amazing and oh, I, it's I think, a very I think, fun show I think while a lot of people will look back at that show and kind of talk shit on it I'm like it's not an accident that it was HBO's number one show for six straight years or whatever it was you know uh, yeah I mean the people that have issues with it I'm sure would have issues with everything that's fun and cool yeah. but um <laughs> <laughs> that's cool and fucking sick yeah as fuck um <laughs> I also like that because it came on after The Sopranos for a mm. long time. And The Sopranos, which it has to be one of my top two or three favorite shows of all time, mm-hmm. um, was obviously pretty emotionally and psychologically heavy. Mm-hmm. And then you would get, like, before be- before you went to bed, you got that 23 minutes of entourage that <clears> was fun. Bro, well, I remember there was a time where... People that weren't even like show people or movie people were totally wrapped up in TV. I remember this because my brother is not really that into movies or TV. And he was a loyal member of this group of guy friends that I had that was, you know, like five of us. We got together every Sunday night and we were going to watch three things. Yeah. We were going to watch Curb. We were going to watch Entourage and we were going to watch Breaking Bad. Yeah. All of those came on on Sunday night and it was just like. All of them are going to be awesome, and we're all all in. Yeah, and it was like the idea that you're going to get someone, and I don't know if you have friends like this in your life that just not that they don't like movies. Like I think everyone has certain movies that they love. But my brother, if it's like, hey, you want to go see a movie? It's like, uh, I don't know. You know, you, let's just hang out or let's watch sports or something. You know, let's go do something different. And for him to be like, oh no, I'm gonna be there every Sunday night, and I'm genuinely interested in watching all three of those shows. That's a big thing to show how captivated people were with television during that period of time. Oh, yeah. And and that just that's not even close to existing. I now. mean, all, every I I don't know how many people in my sphere in college at that time got together for Sopranos and Entourage and all that, and and Chappelle Show was another thing we all got together for in college, and. Man, that you don't really have that much anymore, do you? Because and I don't know if it's because stuff streamers. Well, yeah, yeah stuff doesn't come on Sunday at nine. Yeah, so you, it's not. Yeah, but I will. Fun. But I'd also argue that I don't think there's anything on Netflix that has captivated people, like I said, that aren't necessarily movie or show people like those shows did. I mean, bro, Breaking Bad was insane. You know, and I'm not saying it's the best show of all time. It's one of my favorite shows of all time. Certainly, one but, of the most well written shows of ever but, of all time. That captivated the whole country. It felt like. Yeah. I mean, it felt like everyone was and then, all and, in on it that It wasn't show. quite as popular, but Mad Men was yes. around at that time. Yeah, uh, Sopranos was still going. It was great. Yeah, it, that that was like the impetus of like the golden. I era. think they do and say then, that was the golden age. Yeah. That was when people really started saying, "Oh, that that was when everyone started saying TV is better than movies." Yeah, that. But then, and then people tried to proclaimed that the golden age stretched out way longer than it did yeah. um, when it was all watered down and shit. And then but, there were, and then there was movie, there was shows that here's what rubs me the wrong way is when shows started coming out that were good shows, but then everyone kind of starts throwing in like it's as good as breaking bad or whatever, you know, yeah, and I'm just kind of like, ah, it's I remember not. that in acting class being like, and this was 2011. People were still trying to say that we're like in the golden age of television and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I think we're kind of towards the tail. End yeah. I mean, that. not to, and now we're way past it. Well, not to, Hopefully this doesn't offend you. I'm not sure what your opinion on it is, but <laughs> let, you know, it's going to be pretty hard to offend me. But I, I really like Succession. But, oh yeah. But, but people throw that around as if it's in the same realm as Breaking Bad, and I don't see it that way personally. That's my opinion on it. Yeah, I mean, and it's mostly due to there's just a lot in that show. I think the acting's great. I think the writing's really fun. There's a lot in that show that just like doesn't matter. Like in Succession. Yeah, and here's what I mean by it. It's it's not that it's obvious that it doesn't matter, but here's why, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. Okay, end of the second season, Kendall drops the bomb, turns on the dad. Yeah, you know, looks in the camera. My dad knew about everything, right. and it's like, oh shit, how are they gonna get out of this? And then that's the whole thing in season three. And then at some point in season three, they just kind of wave it away and go, oh, it turns out 
maybe you know that things aren't as bad as we thought they were and then they just like there's things that will happen and the stakes are set like crazy high and then it's just like oh psych we're just gonna pull the rug out from under that storyline and it that whole thing is kind of inconsequential now um and they do that a handful of times with like you know we're gonna oh we're gonna have the voter no confidence there's gonna be this whole thing and then like oh psych roman's just gonna totally go back on his word or shiv's gonna totally go back on her word in the finale there, there was just too much of that where I didn't buy the justification of the things that were happening. Because like I was not. like because like like I was like, how would everyone? How was everyone so all in on these files? These files are so bad. They're so terrible. Everyone's all in on it. There's all these smart lawyers and shit looking at it. The dad's fucked. And then just suddenly, oh, actually, maybe it's not as bad as we thought. What do you mean? How is that possible? Because those guys always win. I mean, Logan Roy says it. He's it, it, at one point when Roman is like, he says to Roman, he goes, "Don't you get it? You should always stick with me." You should always pick me. And Roman goes, but why? He goes, because I always win. And those kinds of guys do always win. Mm. And those kinds of guys do skirt yeah. legal issues. And like you could say all those things are irrelevant, but that is exactly what Kendall's downfall is in the end. Yeah. And I all of their, downfall, their downfall is, is that they're not as I Logan Roy. I, I don't know if I've ever disliked a character as much as I dislike Shiv. <laughs> that oh, last she's season. Awful, but, she was brutal. Bro. Um, but as, as Logan says to them, towards it, like one of the last I think it is the last thing he says to all of them he goes you're just not serious people yeah that's and and so that and and you could say like oh, shit. oh well Kendall like kills this guy and nothing ever really comes of it right no oh, uh-huh not well, the case that's what brings him down in the end Shiv brings that up and that's what he has that meltdown at the end right before yeah. the vote and he she's like you killed somebody yeah, And you thought that that, I mean, I think a lot of people probably thought, oh, I guess that's going to go by the wayside. He's never really going to have to pay the consequences for killing that guy, even though he does, because the season after that, he's essentially Logan's bitch. Yeah. And uh, is completely broken. Yeah. And soulless. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I wouldn't, I'm not offended, but I don't agree with that. <laughs> Uh, I think I think that show is is up there with all the best shows mm -hmm. of all time, personally. Mm -hmm. And maybe I mean maybe it's because it was a gem in a in a what is I think it's a, a very good coal, show. I think I just put which... I put Breaking Bad in like such a class that yeah I think is maybe very difficult to ever attain. And I I I just feel like Breaking Bad never really let me down, and I kind of feel like Succession did in mm. certain pop moments, um, but. Uh, I mean, I would say for me, they're both ten out of ten. Yeah, I'm trying to think. There, there was go down point. in the annals of time as greatest television ever. You know what I love? Is, uh, I, even though it's not a good movie, that semi pro movie with Will Ferrell. I think that's hilarious. But whenever he goes, when people look down <laughs> at the annals of history, they're going to talk about three things, <laughs> and I can't remember what they are, but it's something along these lines. He's like the invention of the telephone. He's like, he's like the winning of the World War, yeah. and, and the Second World War. He's like in the Flint, Michigan Mega Bowl, or whatever it is. Like, One of my favorite parts of that, and it's such a small, like throwaway part. It's like Jackie Moon and the the announcer dude, uh -huh. the blonde guy who's kind of he talks yeah, in that yeah, funny yeah. way. They're like, Will Arnett's hilarious. Will Arnett's hilarious, but like Jackie Moon, I don't know what he says exactly, but it's basically like, oh, let's go out and 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 uh, let's go out tonight and and bang some bra or like. <laughs> have some whatever he's like basically go out and hook up with chicks or whatever and he's like oh i better not i'm a oh, married yeah. guy and he's like come on he's like all right yeah <laughs> i like i like at one point I they're like that guy's name but he's a hilarious comedic actor yeah he's isn't he in he's he start he was like in commercials and then he's he, he eastbound he, and down or am i making that up i think no he, he's in eastbound and down he's, and he like loses his mind yeah he's also in um that was a weird. Show. He's an Eastbound I mean, and Down. He's April's new husband. Yeah, exactly. And he, and, and he like and has Danny a complete McBride, meltdown. Kenny Powers steals him away, uh, steals her away. And then he's also the doctor in um, the tech show, Silicon Valley. Mm. Have you ever seen Mr. Robot? The USA show with Remy Malek. Yeah, I saw the first two seasons. I okay. really liked it. Yeah, the the first season's amazing. I Maybe never really I just watched saw the first season. I never really watched the second one. But Christian but Slater's I, really good in that. I too. wanted, yeah, I wanted to bring that up because you brought up unreliable narrators, and I thought yeah. that was one of the coolest unreliable narrators. Yeah, I've yeah, ever yeah. Seen. Um, I thought that was really good, well done. Like the last, I remember, I think it's like a ten episode first season. I remember being like, this show's good, this show's good, 
and then episodes like seven to ten were mind blowingly good. I, um, and the bad guy was pretty good in that. I forget. Yeah, Tyrell Willing Ty- was, yes. was a character, but yeah. but. <laughs> It's impossible for me to ever think about Christian Slater without thinking about this Patrice O'Neill joke where he was ro- he was at the roast of Charlie Sheen and he goes uh, he's talking about Charlie Sheen and Patrice and he goes he goes yeah your career man he goes there was just something very Christian Slaterish about it all and he goes it's like he sucks but he's good but he sucks. <laughs> And it was so funny. And it is so true. I feel like Keanu Reeves kind of has that too. Keanu Reeves um, definitely has that. And I think that. he has it more than them. I think Keanu they're both Reeves better. Has it but more Keanu than Reeves anyone, has it I where it, I used to talk to my one of my good friends about this. We would say he asked me one time because he's not he's into movies, but just he's just a normal guy that just watches movies. Like he had no interest in the business. So sometimes he'll approach me with these questions as if I'm some expert. And he was like, Man, I gotta ask you a question. And he goes, like is Keanu Reeves a good actor or not? He's like, because I hear people talking shit on him all the time. He's like, but that motherfucker's in some badass movies. And I was like, bro, he's like Eli Manning. I'm like, he's like, he's in some movies where you're like, God damn, this is like the worst I've ever seen anyone act. And, and Eli he talks Manning, like he's mildly impaired. Eli Manning used to have those games where he'd yeah. throw four picks and just look like, bro, I could have played better but than that. But then that last two but minutes, then, he's like the greatest but then, quarterback of all time. But then there's like, playoffs on oh, the, yeah. you know playoff you know the, the the conference championship you're down four with two minutes left and he's got the ball and you're shitting yourself because you know he's not afraid and you're just like because and he's probably going to come up huge when it when the pressure's on and he really wants to he's like yeah i could do that yeah but <laughs> eli <laughs> uh, there's a total side but i was a huge i'm I, I i'm not as much of a giants fan anymore but at yeah. that time with yeah. plaxico burris and yeah. and the the running back brendan jacobs and all those Ahmaud guys bradshaw ahmad bradshaw Derek ward earth wind and fire jeremy shockey jeremy shockey and then you then had, had, and then you had Boss. strahan we justin had, tuck justin on tuck we had uh those all the antonio pierce was a really I mean, it was just a great team. But that is exactly how Eli would be like. You would watch three quarters of the game and be like, he really shouldn't be in the NFL (laughs) because he doesn't. I don't think he knows where he is. I don't know what that pass. But then the last two minutes, it got to the point where I I, I, like uh, Giants fans would be like, you know, there's no one I'd rather have out there right now in these last two minutes because I don't know if it's like his brain doesn't really work. (laughs) Have you ever seen what Peyton said about him? About, well, like, well, we didn't know if, if Eli could talk for, like, the first six years of his life. Well, bro, but this is what my brother and I used to say. I, we And we both were Eli Manning fans, too, because we felt like he got so much shit, so it was fun. Even though I didn't have any Giants, loyalty, it was fun to see him succeed after everybody would talk shit on him. And so, but what we would say, it's like, it's almost like he... <laughs> it's almost like he's too dumb to understand the pressure. Right. So therefore he's not nervous because yeah. he just doesn't even understand how giant he's the moment like, is. He's uh, just what's yeah. the play? <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. Well, wh- how is this two minutes any different than the right. beginning? It, yeah, it's Why the last, should I be it's more It's the pressure? last minute of the Super Bowl. Yeah. I'll just fucking throw a Hail Mary <laughs> I'll throw up the three field. dimes yeah. in a row. Yeah. Like, but the, and the that's play- the thing. It's like yeah. in those moments, it's just like he was as cold as ice and there's yeah. no like... Whereas Peyton one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, but I think Peyton would get in playoffs and then it's like, okay, I'm supposed to be the best quarterback in the league. I'm supposed to, that my legacy, yep. I can't choke again. I've already lost in the big moments before. I can't do that again. Everyone's going to be talking about it and I think he would get, but know, it was essentially this. like so brilliant that he was his own offensive coordinator and called yeah. plays at the line of scrimmage yeah. and like was, I mean, I still it, think Peyton's underappreciated to this day for how I mean, good he was. It, people, he was a guaranteed, you, you could put him on the tra- most trash team of all time it was a guaranteed 10 wins every single year. Well, yeah, and then that the slot receiver was going to have his best career uh, best season <laughs> yeah. of his career ever. Uh, you know, like yeah, Peyton it's so stupid to me. I mean, this is another. I I hate when people are just like dismiss athletes who are like, you know, all right, they're like a league MVP, uh, you know, put up monster statistics and it's like yeah, but they didn't come through in the clutch. They get the ring. It's like shut the fuck up. It, yeah. Like Charles Barkley is not one of the greatest basketball well, players of all time. Well, that's what I used to time. say about. And like, if Charles Barkley was on the Lakers or the Bulls or any well, of those teams, saying, dude, they like, would have won additional championships. And yet you can have like people can dismiss Dan Marino and like yeah. Charles Barkley for not winning. It's like shut the fuck up. Like I understand you. Both can be true. You can say like, oh, they maybe choked in a big game at one point or whatever. But also. Like Charles Barkley and I, and scored can, 52 points in a, an NBA finals game against Michael Jordan. And I can't stand 
I can't stand LeBron, current LeBron. However, his personality. Yes. Yes. I. I however, he's one of my least favorite people. However, in all of the, for the LeBron haters and the Kobe lovers, you don't think LeBron's career would have been a little different if he comes on to the fucking Lakers with Phil Jackson and Shaq being the most dominant player in the league for his your first four years of being in the league. You don't I, think it would have maybe been a little LeBron, different? LeBron, I think, though, the thing with LeBron is that he inserts himself as like this cultural thought leader Look, when he's, he's, he's one of the dumbest people I've he's, ever heard he's, Bro, all of that I yeah. agree with. I'm like, just when saying you're, for, When you're pretending a to read a book in front of people and then they ask you what the book is about and Look, you act like a, a fifth or you say you've who, watched who, the Or you say you've watched The Godfather on loop in your preparation for the finals and then someone asks you what yeah. your favorite scene is and you can't name one. Yeah. Um, or what, what what's that book about that you're reading? And it's a lot just, of wise words. Yeah. Just started. La, a lot just of wise started, words. but yeah, it's brilliant. But just from the basketball standpoint, I always think that... Um, yeah, it just kind of it just kind of always rubbed me the wrong way. I'm not saying LeBron didn't have his choke moments or coming up short moments, but I was like, let's not act like going into Cleveland with Mike Brown as your coach is a little bit, and you're by far the best player on your team is a little bit different than like a situation that Kobe came into being in with the most successful organizations of all time with the reigning MVP, and then he's going to win like three more MVPs your rookie yeah. year into the next couple of years. Also, and you have Phil Jackson, who most people consider the best coach of all time. Right, yeah. Look, I mean, that's a whole other thing. But it was started <laughs> by uh, the Keanu Reeves thing. And I, Keanu Reeves, it's weird because the Keanu Reeves persona supersedes whatever – technically not great acting you're watching i think like the john wick movies i enjoy yeah. those movies yeah. i'm not generally a fan of those kinds of, i'm not a huge fan of those things but i'll sit and watch them. i enjoy the john wick movies a lot and he's good in that but like there's times when he will deliver a line and i just bust out laughing yes. because it's just so it's but at this point it's like he almost has his own style like it's just like you're watching the keanu reeves school of acting and i wouldn't it's like we were talking a while ago. It's like there's golfers who it'd be like you would never be like, all right, uh, twelve year old aspiring golfer, uh, take a look at John Rahm's swing mm -hmm. or take a look at like uh, Tony Finau's swing or Scotty Sh Scotty Scheffler is the number one player in the world. No one would tell you to, to, like to duplicate his swing, right? But it's like, how are you going to tell me the number one player in the world's not great? You know, yeah. and I think it's the same thing with Keanu Reeves. It's like. Uh, okay, well, I think box office success has to be measured into an actor's career in some capacity, and he's maybe at the top of the list. So. There's also a thing, though, that uh, my friend Audrey that I've mentioned to you a couple of times talks about this. And when she said it, I was like, wow, I've never really thought about that, but it's a really good point. She said that, you know, even at a low level of acting, it's almost like the you know how people uh, people used to, this always used to be like common knowledge where it's like we need to get you in front of casting directors this year right and it's you're not going to book this year but we need to start getting you in front of them so they start to learn who you are and stuff and she said it has to get to a point to where they just like you as a person and they root for you because there's a subconscious thing that happens where you know if they had never seen you before and they watch you and maybe you make a really weird choice with a line, right? They go, what the fuck was that line choice? But if they know you, and then you make that weird choice with the line, it's like, oh, that's Brett. Mm -hmm. You know, Brett always does that. He's always doing weird stuff. You know, and they, it's like a subconscious thing that once you're used to it, you like it. And I, that's, I think that's what's happening with the Keanu Reeves thing, where if someone else did a horrible line reading with that thing, you would go, Jesus Christ, that's terrible. Yeah, if but, someone else talked like, oh, yeah. But but now he does it, and you're like, God, Keanu yeah. Reeves is fucking it, well, awesome. It, it, even know? in the John Wick thing, I was watching with Keisha, and like, she's a way better bigger fan of those movies first Keisha has probably seen more movies than you and I combined really I don't know of anybody who has seen more movies than well me. I think a lot of actors actually get in this kind of vicious cycle where they kind of watch less than most people yeah because they have to have one job where they're trying to make money and then they're trying to pursue their own stuff so and their then, their downtime of just watching shit I think is usually less than the average yeah, person. Actually. Yeah, I would agree with that. And also, I think I know what happened with me is that once you start acting and if you gain any kind of success and you feel like you're kind of in the even on the periphery of the business, it starts to become like there was times there was probably I don't know when this stretch was, but I do remember when I was in the thick of my like acting training and career and stuff like that, that there would be movies I I almost couldn't watch because I was too sad that I wasn't a part of it. Mm. Whereas obviously she's not dealing with that at all. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Just because it's, I think it's a fun topic. Are there, 
for some reason, I don't know why, it is one of my favorite movies, but for some reason, the movie that I think of that I'm like, I wish I was, you know, one of like the leads of that movie more than anything is Social Network because that movie's just so fucking cool to me. Like the idea of being, you know, in your 20s as Andrew Garfield or uh, Jesse Eisenberg or I don't know how old Justin Timberlake was, but that movie feels like such such a cultural phenomenon type of movie, like iconic. And it was just, I just love that movie. I think it's amazing. I think everyone in it is great. And I think there's something very exciting about that movie to me in the sense of feeling like, oh my God. I'm in my 20s. I'm playing this big part in this movie. Like this is the t- that's the type of movie that I'll have dreams about being in a movie like that of I've got this giant director, the script's amazing. I'm one of the leads. Maybe I'm not even the lead, but I'm like a, got a big part in it and it's all these other youngish kind of actors and there's just this energy where it's like we're all about the fucking And it's pop and, off. and the cultural significance of the movie. It's yeah. about Facebook. And, and just like knowing how good it is, knowing how good the director is so you really know it's going to be good and then that feeling of like we're about to pop off. Well, like this is going to be awesome. Uh, 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 a top flight director and one of the greatest screenwriters yeah. ever. Have you ever seen like the behind the scenes of them I've working seen on that? I've some of it. I've seen when... Jesse Eisenberg talks about it and it's like when you're doing an Aaron Sorkin movie, it's different than other movies because you're... you're you have to be word perfect on every Well, you have thing. to be word perfect and you have to speak with a certain cadence because there's so much dialogue jammed into what he's doing. It's like it's like he's he was famous for those... Uh, what was that show? The West, West Wing. Wing. Those walk and talks. No one talks like that. Yeah. I mean, e- even and and you're fine. It's fine. I don't even care. I don't yeah. even care that that's not really how people operate in the real yeah. world. I mean, there are walk and talks, but nobody's walking and talking that fast with three or four people. But have you just, ever have you heard you know, dialogue ever, just firing back and forth? But have you ever great heard about watch. why he he started doing the walk and talk? No, was because he was doing. I don't remember if West Wing was his first thing that really popped, but he would just write these scenes you know he was a nobody and he would just he was like dialogue just always came easy to me yeah he was like i loved writing dialogue he goes it felt like i was writing music and i just was addicted to yeah, writing because he was a big he, uh musical theater when he was a kid and so he just loved writing it yeah and then i think his first you know screenplays i think it was on west wing he was literally he literally sent in these screenplays and they were like okay but it's just every scene is just people in a desk or at a desk talking to each other back and forth. They were like, they need to be like doing something. And then he just, he goes, and I just didn't have any original ideas. So I was like, well, what if we just had him like walking while they're doing this? Yeah. And he said, that was literally it because he says as good as, as confident as he feels in his dialogue, he's not confident in having like an interesting activity that they're doing at the same yeah, time. Yeah. Like his action blocks are always minimal. So I think he's, he said it was literally by necessity that the show was telling him they have to be doing something. And so he was like, well, what if we just had him walk? And then it became this fascinating thing. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, he's definitely heavily influenced by theater. I've watched him. I, I think I watched like a master class of his yeah, I've seen or some something of that. like that where uh, he seems pretty cool in those master classes. I mean, he seems, I mean, uh, definitely a lot to learn from. I yeah. mean, if, like even if you're, that's not your writing style, never would be your writing style. Yeah. Still, he still has a lot of gems. Like he, the story he tells about like what a story is. He's like, you gotta have the, you know, the two kids start in New York city and they're going on a road trip and, and he call, describes it as like, um, uh, like a, a uh, what's it when you f- dart? A, no, not a dart, but like a a lot, like a rope that you have where you hang clothes up, clothes line. Clothesline. <laughs> All right, we're done. The only thing that would have made it better is if you would have said like a line that you hang clothes up. Yeah, it's like a line, there's and there's clothes, clothes on it. <laughs> um, the clothesline. He's like, basically, you have to have the clothesline that you hang the events on. Mm. But you have to have that story. And you would think that like Aaron Sorkin is maybe not thinking about that first because it's yeah. just so dialogue heavy. Yeah. But he's like, that's what gives me the freedom to do the dialogue is I have the, this goes to this, 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 like, you know, and once you have that story, then you can kind of insert like that, that kind of like rhythmic dialogue that he likes. But he does talk about how when he was a kid, musical theater was his thing or theater was his thing. And he noticed the rhythm of it, which I love too. I mean, I love... I, I can watch people have uh, flap their gums if it's inter- like any Tarantino yeah. stuff or whatever. And some people don't like that, but I think I it's mean, one of my favorite great. scenes of all time is Andrew Garfield's freak out moment in social network when he realizes he's getting screwed he's getting over screwed, yeah. and he, and he storms out and yeah. Mark, you know, yeah. and then he slams a computer like that and back and like, forth coming, is I'm so coming back to take everything. <laughs> but, I, and I love, I love when he's walking out 
and Justin Timberlake goes, hold on one second. And he goes, he goes, Hey, here's, um, he goes, here's, you know, your last check or whatever. And he goes, but you might want to wait a second to cash it. He's like, cause I pulled it from the account that you froze. And like, bro, it's like, it's so good. Yeah. Like, and, and Andrew Garfield goes and like acts like he's going to yeah, hit him. Yeah. And then he says, it's, this is one of those lines that this is one of those lines that it's hard for me to really unpack why I think it's so brilliant. But sometimes I think there's just a line where you just hear it and you're like, that's just so fucking good. Like, and it's mm. hard to unpack why kind of, <laughs> but, but he does that. And Justin Timberlake flinches yeah. and he goes, I like standing next to you, Sean. He goes, you, you make, make me feel you, so tough. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, it's just such a great fucking I mean, cut down. I, like to be cutting, like, to be like, yeah. I'm not tough. But you're such a bitch that yeah. you make me, you feel, make me tough. feel tough. And yeah. it's just like, God, that's a I great. Mean, that's and a, he just smirks and then he walks out. That's a hard body thing to say. That's Dude, it's so good. Right and I just feel, I think that movie, uh, yeah. I, I'm oh, in, I love I'm, that movie. I'm in and then, and then, movie. And then when, uh, and then when uh, that Beatles song comes on at, at the end, Baby, You're mm. a Rich Man. Yeah, yeah I yeah. was like, man, that's uh, because that song is just like, what are you going to do now that you're one of the beautiful people is one of the lines in that song. I've got a question. Uh, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 no. Finish your thought. Oh, um, I've got a question for you because this is embarrassing for me because it is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I feel like one of the most important lines in the movie, I'm not sure that I completely understand. Okay. Rashida Jones says to him at the end, because the whole thing is right. You know, she, when he gets broken up at the beginning, she says, you're going to be end up being a very smart successful computer person and you're going to think that people don't like you because you're a nerd or but a dork. because you're but an it's asshole, not right. it's because you're an asshole yeah and then at the end rashida jones says to him you're not an asshole you're just trying so hard to be yeah and i'm not quite sure what the rashida jones line means like why do you think he's trying to be an asshole because i would almost argue i don't know if he's trying to be an asshole um i think he's just like trying to be successful I, I don't know i don't what, well, what do you, that, unpack that in because your i think that movie the the his core issue is that he you know obviously he gets rejected by rooney mara and then he invents hot or not or whatever yeah. and he that that is the impetus for everything he does that scorn of that lack of acceptance that he has hmm. so i think it's what she's saying is like you're not innately a bad person but, but you're, you you've you adopted like, this persona, yeah, and you're not you're never going to go back on it because yeah. you're too you're he's in he, in like again uh, like Aaron Sorkin talks about it. It's like he had to make Mark Zuckerberg a real character in a movie, and he wasn't just trying to like do the Mark Zuckerberg biography. So yeah. it may not be exactly how Mark Zuckerberg is or whatever, but the 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 core wound that he has is from the rejection. And then that makes him make hot or not. That makes him, that kind of turns him into an asshole. So I think it's what she was saying is like, you had to become an asshole or you became an asshole to, to thrive in this world, but you're not really an asshole. And that's yeah. why this is hard for you. Because yeah. if you were really an asshole, you wouldn't care about any of this. Yeah. And it's easy for an asshole to screw people over and make money. But when you're not yeah. and you're pretending like He's alone. He's again alone. Yeah. You know, he's again yeah. rejected. Even though he's had all this success. Yeah. He's fallen out with his friends that he had the success with. He's getting sued by everyone. Yeah. He he will. So for him, he's always going to double down on that. It's me against everyone else. Yeah. Thing. And that makes him an asshole. Yeah. I think you're right. Now, God, that movie, man. There's so many lines, you know, like I, there's so many iconic lines that I remember in that kind of instantly went you know to their extent viral you know yeah. a million dollars isn't cool you know what's cool a billion, a billion dollars yeah, yeah. you know or um god there, there's uh whenever i love when he says you know like you don't need a forensics team to figure this out if you're if your clients had invented facebook then they would have invented then they would have invented, invented facebook, facebook. Yeah. and it's just like you know his uh like God, hit some of Eisenberg's moments, and I understand it's the writing, but just some of those moments. Well, Eisenberg that he has, is kind of the perfect cast for that. Yeah, but some of those moments he has, you know, in those hearings, especially I think with the Winklevoss twins, when he says, um, when uh, he says something about like, "Do I have your full attention?" and he kind of like snaps and he's like, "No, you don't." He says like, "Because you're in here," like he says like all this stuff, and he he says. Um, 
you have the minimal amount of my attention. He's, and he says, he says like, my attention is back in the, uh, you know, at the headquarters of Facebook where we're doing stuff that no one in this room, especially your clients, could ever even dream of doing. Yeah. And he's, and he's, that he says like, and for you to allude to the fact that I was doing this to win over, you know, the, uh, the finals club or whatever. And he says like, I could currently take the finals club house and turn it into my ping pong table or, you know, or whatever. just like, That's he, has, thing. he was he rejected has so by many, that, that yeah, club. yeah. He just yeah. has so many things like that where he just says, I don't know. It's just phenomenal. phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, it's a fantastic movie. And it was also like, uh, it's enormously culturally significant. Yeah. That'd be a great movie to be in. Um, those are few and far between now. I couldn't think of a movie that's come out recently that I would be like excited to be a part of. I can, I'm sure I could think of one. Let me think like even uh, like if, no one probably believes me, but like, even if I were to get like some sort of Marvel or star Wars thing in now, it wouldn't like if I booked star, a star Wars thing in like 2012, I would, I would, yeah. I would like be, you know, yeah. Elated. What? Now I would be like, Oh, it's cool. I have a job. But what would, director would you be most excited? Tarantino, Tarantino. I, I, I don't mean this in any exaggerated form at all. If I could get one line <laughs> in one of his movies, I would feel as if everything I ever went through was worth it. Was worth it. It's cool. So if you're listening, no, <laughs> uh, no, I mean that that would be. You know, I, I saw this that podcast. Would be the, the coup de there's these kids, you know. Yeah. <laughs> They're like and these kids, kids, man, and, right? And, and, and they're just like, like talking and, and, about and like they, movies, they right? They get like a hundred, a couple hundred views, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, they're passionate, you know. Um, yeah, dude. I, 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 Tarantino. Like I was saying earlier, like this would have been a cool one to be a part of at the moment. Oh, yeah. At, at, at the, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Um, have you ever seen? It, it's like their sequel to this, even though it's not a related made. story made. Oh, not dude. nearly as good, but dude. But there's hilarious. There hilarious is hilarious moments. stuff, but. I don't know. I don't like that movie when, that much. I'll when, admit it. Oh, I love it. When Columbo is the gangster boss, and he's like, I, I don't get it. What, what is it that you don't like? He's like, because I don't like you, you fucking <laughs> cocksucker. He's like, and you, I think you see, I know you stole my van. He's like, and I don't like you, you cock. He's like, all right, well, I guess we cleared that up. Vince Vaughn is great in that, like in the in the part where he's at the at the uh, the house or Wait. he's at the construction site sweeping, and like the <laughs> the the uh, the foreman comes. He's that super uh, like flamboyant gay dude. Uh-huh. He's like ex- he's like he's like he hits him with the whip, and he's like, "Excuse me, do you have a horse outside? Uh, don't don't hit me with your whip." And he's like, "What's what's your name, sir?" And he's like. Bobby Persigliano and he's like and and they just told like John Favreau that was actually John Favreau's name oh okay and he'd already talked to John Favreau he's like is everybody in this house fucking Bobby <laughs> Persigliano and he's like and he's like well he's like hey, well you're gonna have to stay after school Mr. Persigliano and he taps him and he he's like don't don't hit me and then the guy leaves and and he there he's like at the work site and everybody's working he's like he's like you know that guy what is the deal with that guy he's like nah man I'm I, I'm all upset and flustered now. He goes, you know, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take a 15 minute break. I wouldn't be any use to you guys any, now anyway. <laughs> just, the way he says it, I, I just gotta go take a break. I, I wouldn't be any use to you guys now anyway. No, I mean Vince Vaughn when he's rolling. I don't know if anyone's ever been as good as him in the oh, improvised dude. like. And then state. Uh, at the peak of it was probably like Wedding Crashers. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny? There was so much good stuff. I've heard Dax Shepard talk about this before. Uh, that he talks about. I think he was doing. It was Dax Shepard and Justin Long were having a podcast together. I don't remember if it was on Dax Shepard's or on Justin Long's, but they're talking about it. And I think they were talking about that they were going out for a lot of the same stuff like around the time. And I think they say that idiocracy, that is something that Dax is in. Um, and I think they both said that when when idiocracy was coming out, like that script, like everybody was like, this is like the best script of yeah. all time. And they're like, and like it comes out and like, it's a good movie. Like it's good. Yeah. But they said, but the script, everyone was like, no one wanted that movie more. No, nobody wanted anything more than they wanted that movie, Idiocracy. And he goes, and then you take something like Wedding Crashers that everyone read and they're like, ah, oh, it's okay. It's pretty funny. It's, you know, whatever. But then you see what Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn do yeah. with it and you're like mind blown. And you know. Bradley Cooper. Dude, he 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 he's, he's great in that. If you go back and watch Bradley Cooper now, it's pretty next level shit because he was doing the frat bro humor that became so popular like 
that movie came out in like 2008. And yeah. then I feel like in or, like, no, probably before then. It was like 2006, 2007. It was yeah. somewhere around there. And then, yeah, you're right. It was before that. I think it's like 2006, 2007. But he's doing like the frat bro humor. And then in like 2015, I feel like all over TikTok and Instagram, like frat bro humor really kind of blew up. And so to go back and watch it and be like, this dude was doing this like nine years before yeah. everybody else, you know, crab cakes in football. That's what Marilyn does. <laughs> but but uh, my brother and I watched that movie not that long ago and we were both just dying laughing at how funny Bradley Cooper was. We were like, dude, he's the best part of this movie. Whenever he's, whatever they, so he catches the touchdown over Owen Wilson on like the first play of the game and he's coming back and the guy his friend is coming up to him to congratulate him, to be like, bro, that's what I'm talking about or whatever. And Bradley Cooper goes, hey, you got to anticipate that rush. And the guy goes, and the guy goes, yeah, I know, but but I'm just, and Bradley Cooper goes, shut up. You got to anticipate that rush. And then he's like, but I love you. But I love you. And that's his head. And yeah. the idea that the guy's trying that in a touch football game, the guy's trying to tell him good play on that touchdown, but Bradley Cooper can't stop thinking about that the guy still yeah. fucked up the play, even though they scored a touchdown. Well, and he's got to yell at him about you got to anticipate that and rush. And it's such like an insane. You're 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 taking like Michael Jordan level assassin type of of like competitiveness and bringing it to like this flat or touch football game in, yeah. your, in your yard. Yeah. yeah. No, that that's uh, that's. That was definitely a movie that uh, <laughs> That's I would have been a Owen Wilson's oil. like he goes, uh, he goes, he goes. Hey, so I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking it might be good to like throw an interception to Claire to like get the ball, get her involved in the game. He goes, you think you can do that? And Vincent goes, John. He goes, I was all state. He goes, I could put the ball wherever I want to. I can make it rain out here. <laughs> and I also love, I also love how. Bradley Cooper's destroying Vince Vaughn in the football game, and Owen Wilson keeps coming up, and he goes, "Okay, look, I think you're milking a little bit too much." And he goes, <laughs> "He goes, he goes. Every time I turn around, you're on the ground like some kind of pussy or something." And like Owen Wilson's trying to flirt with the girl, and uh, and she goes and with Rachel McAdams, and she goes, "Oh no, your brother, he's down again." And Owen Wilson turns around, and he goes, "What?" He's like, <laughs> he's so annoyed. And he's like, "God damn it!" Like walking yeah. over to him. Oh man. That's a great. I I think that is one of my. When I think of game changing iconic comedies, that's one of the ones that I definitely throw in there. As far as first time I saw it, laughing insanely hard, oh, and yeah. uh, like like two that I think about all the time, and they came out right around the same time because I remember people debating which was funnier. But that and Forty Year Old Virgin came out right around the same time, and I think for whatever reason, old school would have been around that time. Yeah, as well. I think old school was before. Yeah, but. 40-Year-Old Virgin, I always say this, that set a trend. That movie came out, and then I feel like every, not a lot of comedies were trying to be that movie for the next like 12 years. Which movie? 40-Year-Old Virgin. I feel like that's what mm. really started that Judd Apatow type of comedy of like talking about sex and talking about it in a very casual way and like very weird, specific humor Yeah. that then tra travels into Knocked Up to Super Bad to like all that whole crew like owned the next like 10 oh, yeah, years you Seth know, role models yeah, yeah, even yeah. if it wasn't a Judd Apatow movie forgetting Sarah Marshall all those movies feel very similar and it's the same group of people and it's like the same type of humor and I feel like even movies that didn't involve those people were trying everyone was trying to do that type of humor like let's just have the scene go on a total sidebar to ver about a very weird specific reference you know like well forgetting Sarah you know, Marshall improvising. is a movie that I would definitely I, I definitely Definitely had it. I thought that was so fucking funny. When Do you like came. that one more than all the other ones kind of in that team of people? Um, What else would be considered in I, that? Like, I mean, Knocked uh, Up, uh, Super Bad. Uh, knocked Up is good. Super Bad is... Yeah, Super Bad and Knocked Up are not. To, I don't dislike them, but To not. me, Knocked Up was the one that blew my top, but not for the main reasons. It's because all the scenes where they're back at the house where it's just all the guys... <laughs> was like the funniest shit yeah, in the yeah. world to me. Like like they're just getting high and playing ping pong yeah. and it's like six guys living and they have their business where they're looking up the naked scenes in every movie. Like the Mr. Skin like, thing. Yeah. yeah. But, but like Catherine Heigl walking in and Seth Rogen just being like, I'm gonna go change my shirt real quick. I'll be right back. And she's sitting in the living room and Jonah Hill's just sitting on the couch <laughs> watching the scene from Wild Things where they're making out. And she already knows what their job is. Yeah. But they're just sitting there awkwardly, and then he just kind of looks at her, and he goes, just another day at the office, you know? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, no, that, that stretch of comedy was fantastic. Here's what I'll say, and I don't know if you'll agree with this. I think... I, I even like... I think Jonah people. Hill is one of the funniest people on the planet when he's acting in a scene like that, especially when he's when he's like the side characters, bro. He is insane. Uh, I would say I, I mean, he's definitely, definitely one of the funnier sidekick characters. I mean, he's he hilarious in Wolf of Wall Street. He's hilarious and knocked up. He's hilarious. Bro, you know what's the most underrated Jonah Hill performance? Him and This Is The End, that movie oh, where, yeah. where the world's ending. He is so funny in that yeah. movie if you go back and watch it back because his whole thing is he's like this enlightened. Like, but he's an like, asshole. Like, like, yeah. like, but no, but like meditation type thing where he's like, oh shit, dude, Michael Sarah's here tonight. And he's like, yeah. and he's like, no, dude, he's like, bro, Lindsay Lohan was like totally normal and then she got involved with Michael Sarah and that's kind of like when she went. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch some of the bloopers in that thing, he <laughs> he's talking about they're improvising and they're talking about Michael Sarah and it's him and that guy that played McLovin can't get through the scene because they keep laughing. And so it's like, I think it's Aziz, uh, the guy that plays McLovin, Christopher Mintz Platz or whatever, and Jonah Hill. And they like can't get through this scene because it's just Jonah Hill improvising, talking about how bad Michael Sarah is. Yeah. And Jonah Hill is like, dude's never met a condom. He's like, I think he has some shit. No, I actually know he has AIDS actually. You know? <laughs> and just, or he says something about like, yeah, dude, he was going to like, kids pageants and stuff and he was like <laughs> like kids beauty pageants and he was like dressing up you know he started putting the makeup on and everything and like and like he's just improvising and then Aziz goes hold on wait he was competing in kids <laughs> pageants and then they all start dying laughing yeah but yeah, he's great in that and he's great in um what's the other one um well he has a brief part in 40 year old version where he's hilarious what's yeah. the movie with him and Justin Long and uh Strange Wilderness no. You sure? No. It, it's him and Justin Long, and like Justin Long's the lead. I'm not going to be able to. Justin Long's the lead. Oh, accepted. Yes. The yeah. college movie. Yeah. yeah. He has a really hilarious scene where, that scene where he starts screaming. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're uh, like, yeah. dude, what, what <laughs> the fuck was that? Justin Long's a really underrated, underrated comedian. He's actor. a good straight. It, yeah. But. But he can be really funny. Have you seen Zach and Mary make a porno? When That's, he's the porn actor? No, I don't remember that. I I, I feel like it's, I saw it. It's funny. Yeah, but. probably drunk and high. I don't remember. But um, yeah, that that whole stretch of comedy was great, and that would be some. That would be awesome to be a part of. It's kind of like gone now, but we can bring it back. We could. You know, it's a but f- there that group is oh moved well, on yeah, to that, other that things. Group. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm and I, I, I don't know, Judd Apatow, I don't know if he could make like a, a good comedy now because he's so like politically captured. I haven't watched it yet, but my cousin, who's pretty, he's pretty in line with our way of thinking. Um, he's definitely not like with that woke bullshit that we're mm-hmm. always talking against. But he uh, he said that the new, that new movie, I think it might be called No Strings Attached, some movie that just came out with Jennifer Lawrence, where the whole point is... She like oh, where she's, she's trying to teach the kid to be cool, basically. Well, have you yeah. watched it? She's dating a little kid. Basically. Have you watched the show? The movie? No, because uh, on Netflix we changed to ads, uh, and they locked it. Weird. On Net- and it's only on Netflix because well, I mean, you and and so on, I might be wrong in this, but he said that movie's really funny, and he said it reminded him of like those type of movies where it feels like it doesn't give a fuck about being offensive Is, or anything. Um, is that a shot of appetite? I don't know. Oh. But but I'm just saying in general, he said like it's good and he said it's it is like they don't give a shit about offending anybody in that that's movie, good. apparently. So yeah, that is nice. The, yeah, that's good. Um <clears throat> because that's what comedy generally Should be. involves. Yeah. Um Yeah. You know it's one that I wanted to bring up a performance from earlier, um, and then we'll wrap up pretty quick, but talking about like the straight man that steals the show. You know what I a movie that I don't think is that great, but a performance that blew my mind. Mark Ruffalo in Foxcatcher. Have you seen that oh, movie? Oh, yeah. Dude, he crushes yeah. in that. And that was an example of a movie where I get it, Steve Carell had like the sexier part that was like the big choices. Yeah. But I just remember being amazed by Mark Ruffalo in that movie, just so grounded and real. And and I think that's another example of like, you're not the biggest character on the page, no. but you are he, to me, he was the best part of that movie, and also brought a real authenticity to the wrestling scenes because so, you, you, I, I 
maybe heard that he was an amateur wrestler in high school or something. I remember hearing but about he the training they did for if, that movie. If he wasn't an amateur wrestler, he had because my dad was a wrestling coach. So mm. I, my whole like when I was a little kid, I was around high school wrestlers all. The I time. think Channing Tatum might have actually wrestled in real life, but maybe I'm. But it up. Mark Ruffalo looked. I mean, it, mm. he. If he didn't, like I said, if he wasn't in amateur wrestling, he had to have like spent a lot of time because his micro movements, mm. like that scene where he's move uh, war- warming up, chanting, well, hitting shoulders, kind of. That's not something that you could just be like, mm. I'm an actor who's in a wrestling movie and will make. That is someone who is profoundly aware of that yeah. that world and like not only aware of it, but you you morphed your body into like he's more like his body is different. In that yeah, movie. he moves different. He, he walks, moves like a wrestler, yeah. and so is Channing Tatum. Yeah. Um f- yeah, fan- and then the whole thing is like you the compromise. We were talking about this before, the compromise that he has to make because uh what's his name? DuPont is paying for his whole life and the, to be the coach. The scene where but he's then he interviewing tried, him. He tries to come in and like you have to like all right, this is the point this is the part where we have to let this crazy old guy pretend like he's going to teach us something and Mark Ruffalo has to be like <clears throat> compassionate. But also, he has to take care of his 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 wrestlers that he knows. They know that something's off about this, and the balance, the delicate walk that he has to do. Yeah, the, he's the, fantastic. I man. think you know a movie's having a big impact on you when you talk out loud when you're watching it by yourself. Yeah, and I remember watching that movie by myself, and uh, the scene when Ruffalo's getting interviewed by the camera yeah. and they want him to say say he was like a father to you. Yeah. And he's like what do you mean you want me to say he's like a father to me? And and that that back and forth goes on for it feels like like 4 minutes yeah. and he's kind of like yeah but he's not really like a father to me. So like what do you mean what do you want me to say? And and they just kind of there's the way they finagle it and then he just kind of like says it and then it just cuts. I remember going wow. Yeah. Like, like I was just blown away by I how mean, good and, he I is. Mean, that is that. like Shakespearean tragedy right there. Cause yeah. that guy sold his soul essentially to, well, he was also trying to look after his brother. Yeah. yeah. But, and then that guy kills him. Yeah. Which I mean, so wild, bro. Um, nuts. I mean, just, it, just nuts. So, th- so think about this. I, cause I remember this that year. Th- this was the best supporting actor category for that year. Mark Ruffalo for Foxcatcher, Edward Norton for Birdman, and J.K. Simmons for Whiplash. Whoa. All in the same year. Wow. And J.K. Simmons won. And J.K. Simmons won. And I remember being like, I remember that whole time. 2015 or 16? It, it, was, it was 14 14? or 15. It was, it was either 14 or 15. But I remember being like, seeing Whiplash and being like, J.K. Simmons should win. Like, he should win. It, that was amazing. But then... But then also being like, but fuck, Edward Norton was so good. And then watching Foxcatcher and being like, God damn, it's like, I still probably think JK should win. But I was like, but literally any of these dudes should win on like almost any other year. Yeah. And it yeah. was just like, this is like the most stacked year ever. Yeah. Again, another reason why it doesn't matter who wins and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Because that, what are you going to say that Mark Ruffalo's performance is not one of the greatest ever, even though he didn't win the Oscar? I mean, of course not. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, have you seen Billions? 